For context, this took place almost two years ago. I was 26 at the time. I was in Washington on sort of a vacation visiting my then fiance. We'll call her Sarah for the sake of this story. It was for a graduation she was having for basic training. It was a big deal for her family, and she asked me to be there for it. So I said why not, and booked a flight. I would be arriving a week before the rest of her family, so her and I could have some time together, just the two of us, before she would be busy having all of her family there for the occasion. She stayed with me at my hotel during this time, and eventually we decided that we wanted to get out and explore some of the nearby historical sites that Washington has to offer. I had never been there, of course, so the idea piqued my interest. Once we arrived at our location, we spent about four hours walking around and seeing all the sites, from the Lincoln Memorial to the Washington Monument, the Congress Building, and even the White House. It was a very fun and exciting experience for myself to see all of these places, as I had missed out going on a school trip in high school to visit them. Sarah at the time seemed to appreciate my interest in them, and we basically enjoyed ourselves. After we finally decided that we had had enough of walking around and were ready to go back to the hotel, we used the Uber app to call for a ride. We had used it before to arrive and had no issues, so we decided just to use it again for the ride back. Sarah made the request on her phone while I sat down under some shade and waited. I was pretty tired from all the walking we had done, and I could feel that I was ready to get back to the hotel for a nice long nap. Eventually, after about 10 minutes of waiting, a car pulled up in front of us. Sarah mentioned to me that this must be our Uber, as the place that they had stopped at was not a parking spot. I stood up and followed her to the car, where she opened the back door and stepped inside, asking the driver, Hey, you're the Uber, right? He gave a slight nod to her without saying anything and I then followed her into the car, shutting the door behind me. Now looking back on this, I realize how dumb we were. We should have been asking for the driver's name and verified it on the app. I didn't have access to any of this myself, as Sarah was the one who had made the request on her phone, so none of these concerns occurred to me at the time. As we both sat in the back seat of the car, which was a gray-colored van, the driver didn't say a word. I found this a bit odd as any other Uber driver we had had would at least greet me once and confirm my name and the address I was supposed to be driven to. But this guy? Nothing. The vehicle began moving without the driver acknowledging either of us, other than that brief nod he had given to Sarah. I did pick up on how weird it was, but I was tired and I didn't really feel like trying to engage the man myself. I laid my head back and just closed my eyes. I then felt a tap on my arm from Sarah after what felt like only five minutes into the ride. I opened my eyes and looked at her. She didn't speak to me. I could see the look on her face was one of worry and it had me wondering what exactly she was concerned about. He then pointed to her phone, which was showing the route the Uber would take to drive us back to our hotel. It didn't take me long to realize that we were heading in the opposite direction. I could see the color in Sarah's face drain. Shortly after, a notification popped up on her phone, saying that our Uber had arrived, followed by a message from the driver asking where we were. The picture that popped up on Sarah's phone did not match the driver of the van. My heart sank into the pit of my stomach. I then knew that we had gotten ourselves into a situation I never thought that we would be in. I slowly looked back towards the driver, but I didn't say anything. I didn't know what this man's intentions were or what he was capable of, and I honestly did not want to find out. I just knew at that moment that I had to get us both out of this van. I leaned forward and told the man that we had changed our minds and would be fine with being let out where we were. This was an attempt to get us out of the situation without alarming the man that we knew. 
He glanced at me through the rearview mirror, and the first actual acknowledgement of me since we had gotten into the vehicle. I caught his glance as he stared at me without saying a single word in what felt like minutes. It was probably only about 10 seconds. He didn't stop the van, and he didn't say anything in response to me, and just kept driving as if nothing had been said. My patience had run out, and I knew that whatever this man had in store for us wasn't good. I then did the only thing I could think of in that moment and reached into my pocket, pulling out my pocket knife I always carried on me. I flipped out the blade, and without wasting another second, I told the driver, We know that you're not the Uber. I don't know what your plan is here, but I have a knife, and if you don't pull over right now, I'm going to stick it right in your temple. The driver's eyes quickly looked at me again in the rearview mirror, and I knew he could see me gripping the knife in my hand. He then quickly pulled the van over, and I heard the doors unlock. Sarah and I wasted no time getting out as fast as we could. The moment we were both outside, the man sped off. We quickly took a moment to gather ourselves as Sarah was having a panic attack, and I was still trying to wrap my mind around what the hell just happened. Sarah quickly pulled out her phone and responded to our actual Uber driver and informed him of our location and asked if he wouldn't mind picking us up. The Uber driver arrived a few minutes later and this time we made sure it was the right one. We told him everything that had happened. He then informed us of something that made the blood in my veins turn to ice. He told us that there have recently been multiple instances where people were posing as Uber drivers in that area, as it was easy to find many tourists around there who wouldn't think twice about getting into a car thinking that it was an Uber or a Lyft. The guy told us that we were very lucky to have gotten out of that. We made it back to the hotel without issue and quickly reported this incident to the local police. We gave the description of the unknown driver and the van he was driving. The police told us that they would call us with any further information, but we never heard back from them, so I'm assuming the man was never caught or found. That worries me because he could still be out there, doing this to somebody else. Again, I realized how stupid we both had been and how we didn't verify the vehicle before getting into it, but let this be a reminder to everyone listening to do just that and always make sure you're aware of your surroundings. Long-time listener, first-time submitter. I thought I would pick a story from my past. For some reason, it has made a resurgence and has almost become an unwelcomed guest in my mind. Perhaps sharing it will help me get over it once and for all. The year was 1986, I was 16 at the time. I was in Indianapolis at Union Station. It was around Christmas time or just after. I was with my mom, my two-year-old sister, and my 21-year-old uncle. At this time, my uncle still lived in Indianapolis, while the rest of us lived in southwest Indiana. We were getting ready to leave and drive back home. It was very cold out that day, and I was bundled up in my jacket scarf and gloves. My mom, God rest her soul, could talk a dead man back to life. So I was just waiting for her long-winded wrap-up. It was getting hot standing inside Union Station while wearing all that clothing. So I told her, It's getting too hot in here. I'm going to step out for a minute. My mom nodded, and I went out. There was no snow or wind, just perfect for me to cool down for a bit not even a minute or so of standing outside, right by the double doors, a white Chevrolet pulls up. Two big men with crew cuts were sitting in the driver and passenger seats. They were at least 6'5", and probably about 280 pounds each. I figured they were probably from our local military base, but that was just an assumption. Immediately after seeing me, they stop at the curb roll down the window, and smile. 
Hey, come here. I want to talk to you. The passenger said, Bear in mind that I'm 16. If this were to happen to me today, things would be much different. But as a kid, I was very polite, almost to the point of being docile. I was always very apologetic when I thought I'd screwed up in some way. I look up and I saw a streetlight above me. I looked back at them and started apologetically stating, Oh, I'm sorry. This is not what it looks like. At that moment, it was more amusing to me. I hadn't really considered that I was in some kind of danger. They kept reiterating that they just wanted to talk to me, and I kept explaining to them that I'm not a street girl, and this is not what it looked like, and that I was sorry for giving the wrong impression. It didn't occur to me that they weren't listening to a word that I was saying. All of a sudden, the passenger gets out and starts moving toward me like a hungry dog staring at a T-bone steak. A switch went off in my head, and I was no longer apologetic or embarrassed. I was just pissed, and I yelled, You don't have to get out of your car if you just want to talk to me. I can hear you just fine from here. I suddenly found the 70% Irish and Scandinavian heritage on my dad's side, and it came out in full force. I was proud of myself for having shown some backbone, but there was still a towering, hulking man coming right towards me. I bolted back inside, where my mom was still yammering. Upon seeing me, my mom and uncle were immediately alarmed. They hadn't seen the man get out of his car, but they could tell that I was frightened. I told them what happened, and my uncle asked, What were they driving? A white Chevrolet. My mom then cut in. Go get him! My uncle bolted out of the door and down the street, chasing after the Chevrolet. Get the hell out of the car so I can bust out your teeth! My mom was livid, but I could tell that my baby sister was getting upset, so I tried talking her down. My uncle came back in a few minutes later, winded and worn out. When he caught his breath, he said, I almost caught up with them when they got to that traffic light at the end of the block, but they peeled out right before I got there. Welp, that put a major damper on our trip to Indianapolis. The moral of the story is, ladies and gents, don't allow your good manners to supersede your own safety. Who wants to die being polite? A long time ago, during the pre-internet era, I worked in a local pizza place. I was only 17 at the time. It was a nice operation. The staff and management got along well. Try saying that with a straight face nowadays. One of our servers was a lovely young woman, we'll call her Brittany, who was very much a free spirit. She didn't own a car and would walk to work and would get rides home from other co-workers after her shift ended. She usually worked the late shift and closed up at around 10, usually leaving at about 11 after cleanup. I often gave her a ride home on the nights I didn't bike to work. She would sometimes even hitchhike home if no one could drive her. She was pretty fearless, but always kept pepper spray and a small knife in her purse, just in case. On one busy Friday night, we finished the post-shift cleanup at around midnight. We were the only two left at the very end aside from the owner, who was in the office counting the cash drawers and cataloging the sales receipts. Remember, this was before computers, so this had to be done with an adding machine and pencils. I rode my bicycle that day, as it was really nice outside for the first time in weeks. The owner said that she would give Brittany a ride if she waited until the accounting was done. It would be about another hour or so. She decided not to wait and said that she would just hitch a ride home. We both tried to discourage her from doing that, and I told her that she might not even get a lift in an hour anyways. But she just laughed and said, Hey, I'm a nice looking girl with great legs. Somebody's going to stop, and I have myself a defense kit. 
Honestly, I don't think her penknife would have even cut an apple, but it was something, and the pepper spray she used would at least be effective. I walked her outside, and we talked for a while in the parking lot. She joked about sitting on the handlebars of my bike and saying that I could bike her home. Of course, that wasn't an option. So we both laughed. I offered to stay with her until she got a ride. But she said no thanks, and that no one would stop if they saw her with a guy on a bicycle, and that it would have made them suspicious that we were up to something. So we said our goodbyes and headed off in separate directions. She didn't report to work on her next scheduled day, which was the following Monday. This was highly unusual. She was never late for work, or missed a shift without calling. A couple of days later, her mom came in, frantically asking if her daughter had been to work. She hadn't come home or called since Friday night. If she was coming home late or staying at some place, she would always call her mother. We were all freaked out a little bit. Her mother eventually reported her missing, and the police came around and questioned both me and the owner about that Friday night. The owner being a middle-aged woman and me being a goofy 17-year-old kid didn't interest them much as potential suspects or even persons of interest. After the police left, the teasing started. Restaurant workers can be a hard bunch, especially the kitchen staff, and most have a very dark sense of humor, at least the ones that I worked with. This went on for the next few shifts, and things didn't help when it became evident that I was the last person to ever see her alive. The cops came back into the pizza place and questioned me again, and also my parents which of course freaked them out. Finally, about a week after she went missing, a co-worker was really giving me hell about it, telling the waitresses not to get too close to me or they might disappear. I finally had enough of his underhanded remarks. After he sarcastically asked me where I hid the body, I snapped back. At the bottom of the thing lake, you want to join her? Of course, everyone who overheard this went, Ooh, and agged us both on. Being 17 and stupid, I said. Yeah, I put her on the handlebars, rode out to the dam, and threw her off. Now shut up and leave me alone. That quieted everyone down. He ended up calling me a few names, and we eventually returned to our duties. Well, Brittany's body turned up in the reservoir. She had been sexually assaulted and stabbed to death. There was a reason her body wasn't discovered sooner, but I can no longer recall why. Needless to say, the cops got a whole lot more interested in me now, after that sarcastic tirade at the restaurant, where I unknowingly foretold almost the exact way her body was discovered. They had my parents bring me into the station, and I was questioned again without an attorney present. Back then, unless an arrest was imminent, a juvenile could be questioned without one as long as a parent was there. As the dam was a good 20 mile drive from the restaurant, I was eliminated as a suspect. They made an arrest a short time after that. It was a man they had suspected in a similar incident the previous year. He confessed to both murders in exchange for a life sentence. Obviously, there was no connection between me and him, but I still felt awful. When I went to Brittany's memorial, I just sat in the back quietly. By that point, word had gotten around about my morbid joke that turned out to be true. I didn't attend the burial service. I didn't want to upset her family. A few years later, I got work at a gas station and had the misfortune of selling an arsonist the fuel he used to set his own house on fire. But that's a story for another time. This story happened in September of 2007. I live in Lyon, France. I was 18 years old when this happened. 
I was taking a train back to my hometown from the south of France. I had visited my grandparents in the countryside before beginning my first year at university. I left on a Sunday at around 7 p.m. and I got on the inner city train. Here's a detail that will be important later on. The train was one of those old slam door trains. This means it was possible to open the door while the train was still moving, no matter how fast it was going. It also seemed like this train didn't have any cameras. Once I got on the train, it was mostly empty. As expected, it didn't have any air conditioning, but I couldn't afford the high-speed train tickets, so I would have to endure. About 30 minutes into the trip, the train made its first stop. Three shady-looking men boarded the train, and I was instantly creeped out. The three of them looked like they had just escaped a mineshaft explosion, and they were staring at me like I was a sirloin steak, the kind that costs more than $100. I decided to go into the next car and use the bathroom, but right after getting out of the bathroom, the three men surrounded me. They all had knives. One of them then yelled at me, Give us all your money or we're throwing your ass off the train. I froze in fear, and out of nowhere, one of them struck me in the back of the head, and then they dragged me to the door of the train. One of them opened the door and tried to kick me out while the train was still moving at high speed. Half of my body was out of the train, and I was trying hard to fight them off and prevent them from pushing me onto the gravel. I was screaming at the top of my lungs. I thought I was going to die. Suddenly the train began to slow down. All three of them forced me off the train, and I landed onto some grass next to the tracks. I got up and started running. Once my adrenaline died down, I was processing what just happened. There was definitely something wrong with my leg, something I hadn't felt until that moment. It turns out it was fractured during the fall. A bystander happened to see me being thrown out of the train and called an ambulance for me. And before I knew it, I was in a hospital bed. The police later caught these three crazy men and they were sentenced to three years in prison, along with a huge fine. Yeah, I know. Three years in prison for attempted murder. And this is France. This is just how things go here. But at the end of the day, I'm just glad to be alive. <laughs>